Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this year's Arnold Drapkin Annual Honorary Lectureship. This lectureship is part of our Advancing Idealism in Medicine, or AIM, initiative, which was originally founded by residents and now has grown into an important program for the entire department. And among other things, AIM seeks to connect us with inspirational role models in the humanistic and idealistic practice of medicine in this grand round setting, so that we can all learn from their example. And it's therefore very fitting that the Drapkin Series Award is part of this. Um, Dr. Arnold Drapkin was one of our outstanding Mount Sinai internists who practiced for many years with a tremendous dedication to the patients who belong to his large and thriving practice. He was a superb medical internist at the Mount Sinai Medical Center who practiced for many years, and he recognized the importance of science while never losing sight of the best patient care. Um, in his memory, his wife, Dr. Carol Caton, a well-respected federally funded psychiatrist at Columbia Presbyterian, has established this important lectureship at Mount Sinai in the name of her late husband, and we are grateful for her support for this award. And it's my honor to award today's speaker, Dr. Anupam Jenna, with the Arnold Drapkin Lectureship Award, which I have here with me and which will be mailed to you, Dr. Hello. Jenna. Uh, Dr. Jenna earned his MD and PhD in economics at the University of Chicago, where Stephen Levitt sat on his doctoral committee. He's currently the Ruth L. Newhouse Associate Professor of Healthcare Policy at Harvard Medical School, a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and Associate Professor of Medicine and Practicing Physician at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Jenna's research involves several areas of health economics and policy, including the economics of physician behavior and the physician workforce, medical malpractice, the economics of healthcare productivity, and the economics of medical innovation. Dr. Jenna's work takes a novel approach to the externalities of commonly accepted societal norms on health, as well as the costs of healthcare and society, and has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, and BMJ, among others. More recently, Dr. Jenna has become the host of a new podcast, Freakonomics MD, which is part of the Freakonomics podcast series. We're very excited to have you, Dr. Jenna, and thank you for joining us today. I appreciate the, uh, the kind and lengthy introduction. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know I was going to get a, a nice plaque. Now I can see Dr. Thomas, where you've gotten all these plaques in your wall. I can, I can get the first one up there, so I, I appreciate it. Um, so let me start by saying that I, I hope today to be very interactive. Uh, I, I know most grand round presentations, uh, the speaker uh, you know, kind of speaks to the audience and then takes questions at the end. You'll see from the flavor of the stuff that I'm going to talk about and also um, kind of the, the content that it really lends itself to more of a brainstorming and uh, joint exercise. And I, and I hope you'll participate with me in that. And uh, I think it'll be uh, fun. So, uh, you know, I'm going to just give you a quick introduction to the type of work that I do. And then after that, I will ask you all uh, to either raise your hand virtually or just uh, unmute and throw out, um, throw out answers. And, and this is a place where, you know, don't feel uh, embarrassed about throwing out uh, the craziest ideas. I really want you to kind of think of this as being a much larger version of what I do every day when I sit down with uh, my grad students and, and residents and fellows, and we just come up with ideas. Uh, and that's what I'd like today to be like uh, for you all. So you kind of get a window into that, that part of uh, my life. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so um, um, uh, as Emily mentioned, I'm an economist and a physician at Harvard. Most of what I do is sort of using big data and, and tools from economics to answer questions that I think are of general interest to people in, in healthcare, but also outside of healthcare. Most of the stuff that I work on, uh, you don't have to have a medical degree or a medical background to understand the basic idea and um, hopefully to find it um, interesting. Let me um, first start with just a slide of disclosures. Um, I do a lot of work because of my economics background um, in healthcare sciences, um, often in, in litigation context. None of that work that I'm doing has anything to do with what I'm going to present today. Uh, in general, also with my research, because I try to separate those two issues, but I just want that to be fully um, disclosed. Um, all right, so let me give you a couple of examples of the types of work that I do. Maybe take about five minutes, and then I'll turn it over to you. And, and I keep on saying that because I want your juices to start flowing in your mind and start having the expectation that some of you will hit unmute and throw out some ideas. Uh, so a few years ago, and Emily mentioned I had some work in the BMJ. I, um, I've been lucky to be able to publish a lot of papers in the Christmas issue over the last uh, five or six uh, years. One of the papers we had a few years ago was about whether or not the stress of politics kills. And so the thought was the following. If you look at photos of Obama 
and Clinton and probably other presidents, you'd notice that over their tenure and presidency, their hair, you know, started to gray. And people would say, oh, okay, is this because being president uh, accelerates your aging, um, uh, makes you unhealthier faster? Now, that's a challenging question to study empirically, because if you look at presidents or other world leaders and you compare them to the general population, guess what? They live longer lives. Not a surprise. They're, they're healthier uh, at baseline. They're more educated. They're, they're uh, wealthier. A lot of things that will correlate uh, with life expectancy. So that's not the right thought experiment. And in fact, if you do compare presidents to the general population, they obviously live longer uh, on average. So what we did is say, okay, can we construct the sort of experiment, a natural experiment, whereby two groups of people, uh, one of whom could have become president, but for some reason did not become president, and compare them to a group that did become president or prime minister or some, you know, chancellor or whatever it may be. And so that's what we did. We basically looked from about 1700s until uh, most recent years and looked at individuals who were elected to lead a nation, let's say a president, compared to um, um, individuals who ran in the elections but didn't win. So that's sort of a control group. Uh, and But by chance, uh, you know, 55, 45 margin, something like that, they did win the election. And what you can see is that world leaders live on average about two and a half fewer years than those individuals who ran for office, national office, uh, could have won, but did not win. So that's sort of the thought experiment. We find they live uh, about two and a half years shorter. So there is some sort of credence to the idea that the stress of politics could uh, lead to accelerated aging. Um, sometime after that, we had a piece in the New England Journal of Medicine about gun injuries during uh, NRA annual meetings. NRA is the, the National Rifle Association. And the thought was during these meetings, which can be pretty large, uh, they attract somewhere between 80 and 100,000 people um, uh, each year. Uh, it's not that they just attract people and, and convene a lot of individuals who are interested in um, uh, uh, guns, but also the venues where people might normally use firearms or the things they might do might be closed down. So if an individual goes with a group of people every weekend or once a month uh, to go hunting and several of those members of that group go to the NRA annual convention, maybe that group doesn't convene that, that month. And so what we found was that gun injuries fall during the exact dates of the NRA annual convention. So they're kind of plotting around like this. And then the exact dates of the meetings, which vary from year to year, and they vary from location across locations across the U.S., they fall and then they return right back up to normal um, uh, after the meetings are held. And so that was sort of a thought experiment about, well, what happens if, you know, individuals who weren't, uh, uh, didn't have access to guns for a short period of time because they were at these meetings, uh, what would happen to gun injuries? Uh, because one, one alternative view is that highly skilled users, the types that might go to these uh, meetings, are at low risk of gun injury because they're highly skilled. Uh, and that seems not to be the uh, case. Other thing I would mention is that the effect, the reduction that we see in gun injuries is actually largest in areas that in a given year happen to be closer to where the meeting is being held. So let's say the meeting is being held in um, um, Las Vegas one year. We see a larger reduction in gun injuries in the areas the states that are closer to Las Vegas than in, let's say, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and the idea is that when the meeting is closer to you geographically, you're more likely to attend it. Uh, so that absorption effect, pulling people out of their, no, their kind of normal lives and placing them in this convention, um, has a larger effect when it's closer to you. And then the last one is when some work with Athene ben, uh, Venkata Ramani, who's uh, at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen the movie The Replacements with Keanu Reeves. I just raise your hand if you've seen the movie. I see like, okay, raise your hand if you've seen it, but you're embarrassed to say you've seen it. No, nobody said that. Um, so it's not a bad movie. You know, I don't, I'm, I'm not a spokesperson for Keanu Reeves or uh, uh, The Replacements. But it was this movie about, um, I think it was a 1987 NFL player strike. The, the NFL um, Players uh, League went on, uh, union went on strike, and uh, the NFL decided to continue games uh, even though their main players were on strike. And they did that by getting these replacement players, and that's why the movie was called The Replacements. These are individuals who may be paid, played in the Canadian Football League or uh, – um, uh, played in the NFL for a short period of time or were um, very good college players, but not quite good enough to, to make the NFL. And the reason we study that is because we were interested in whether or not playing in the NFL leads to premature mortality. Now, same issue as the presence. If you look at NFL players, they tend to live longer than the general public. 
And that's because it takes someone special physiologically to be able to do what an NFL player does. Now, that being said, uh, if you saw the movie Concussion with Will Smith and, and you're familiar with CTE, uh, the brain injury that can result from the sort of traumatic injury of playing football, wouldn't be a surprise that there might be some causal factors that put um, uh, NFL players at elevated risk of accelerated aging and, and, or, and earlier than expected uh, mortality. So again, you need a control group. You need some sort of natural experiment. And so that's what we did is we looked at players who were in the NFL. We got all the team rosters over the, all the years uh, um, that, that we looked at. We identified players who were replacement players. We got data from the CDC on vital statistics to look at whether or not each one of these individuals had died by the end of our study period and just looked at the mortality rates between these two groups. And, and what you see is that the NFL players have a slightly higher mortality than the replacement players. And there was an increase in things like uh, neurodegenerative diseases. That's what's the, 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 the administrative claim that might show up on a death certificate. So it was consistent with this idea that there may be a causal effect of playing um, uh, professional football um, on, on premature mortality. Um, last one, and then I'll sort of turn it over to you, is uh, most of the work I do is in health. Not all of it is in health. Um, this is a piece, um, uh, I think we didn't publish this as a scientific article. This was in the New York Times. This was with Cass Sunstein, who is um, um, a lawyer, um, a legal scholar at, at Harvard Law School, and it wrote a book called Nudge. Um, and uh, so this is basically using data from Florida. Uh, we had data on all individuals in the state of Florida who had been pulled over uh, by a police officer. We knew the names of the drivers and we knew the names of uh, the officers who pulled them over. And what we showed is that when a driver is, let's say, pulled over a few times over the course of five years, the driver was more likely to get a ticket in it was less likely to get a ticket in instances when the officer that pulled them over shared their same first name. So um, if Emily is pulled over by an officer named Emily, she is less likely to get a ticket than if she is pulled over by an officer uh, uh, named Lisa. Uh, so you can see my first name is Bapu. So that, that doesn't bode well for me, at least not for police in the, in the state of uh, Florida. Um, but, you know, you might say, all right, well, what's the effect here? OK, I, you know, I kind of get it that there's this sort of shared similarity between two people who share the same first name. Um, how big is the effect? Well, we know that there's racial bias in policing. The benefit to a driver of um, having the same first name as the officer that pulls them over is the same in magnitude as being a white driver versus a black driver. So that puts it in context that the, you know, the, the effects that we're talking about here aren't small and I might liken it to a, you know, a clinical you know, example. Like, you know, when I walk into a room and um, I start talking to a patient, if they have a, like a, even a twinge of a Southern accent, next question is going to be, where are you from? If they say Virginia, next question is going to be, where in Virginia? If they say Richmond, Virginia, they probably bought themselves five minutes more in the room with me than they otherwise would have. And you can imagine that if you analyze data over thousands of such encounters, that that extra five minutes or 10 minutes might change the encounter in a way. Maybe they tell you something that they wouldn't have told you. Maybe they're more receptive to whatever recommendations you or the team uh, makes because you have that shared bond. In this case, in the, in the, in the, in the research that I described, the shared bond was the same uh, first name, but there could be other elements of it um, as well. So that's just the flavor. Let me, I just said there's a, something that came up in the chat. Okay. So uh, Michael Greenberg said, was the slight difference between regular NFL players and replacement players statistically significant? So this, uh, in this paper here, I think the, the, the p-value was like 0.06. I, I, I won't give you the backstory behind it, but there's a bunch of different specifications that we, we ran. Most of them would be statistically significant at sort of conventional levels. The one that we put in the abstract, if you happen to pull up the paper, is probably like 0.06. So the way I would interpret that finding is that there's certainly a signal there um, and if I had to bet, I would say that there is, uh, there is an effect of playing in the NFL. But if you look at the abstract, I don't know if you can pull it up at some point. It, it may be like 0 0.06, 0 0.07, something like that. All righty. Um, so that was just uh, you know, a little introduction to the type of stuff uh, that I do. And I'm going to slow down my speech now because now I want you to start thinking about 
these sorts of questions. Uh, as you can see, they're sort of all over the place. They're not uh, specific to a particular research topic, uh, a particular disease setting. Um, uh, they're very general. And uh, they have sort of like a spark of cleverness or creativity. And that's really what drives me in a lot of the work that I do. Um, it's not for everybody, but it, it's certainly something that I get passionate about and I get excited about it, And it makes me want to do more of that kind of work. So that's a flavor of what I do. And now I want to turn it over to you. I'm going to show you a set of pictures uh, or maybe some words. And I just want you to throw out whatever ideas come to your mind. Uh, we have until about 925. And we'll get through as many examples as we can. And maybe the first example will spend a little bit more time. Um, and then I'll go faster and faster because I just want you to get exposed to the different sorts of ideas and ways of thinking about these problems. All right. So let me just ask an easy question and just unmute, uh, if you don't mind. What is this a photo of? Boston Marathon. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sakshi said Boston Marathon. All right. So you got, the, you got it right. This is the uh, photo of the Boston Marathon. Um, either, so either for you or your colleagues, what ideas come to mind? Any sort of research idea you could say, and just use the word marathon. You could say, what's the effect of watching, uh, uh, um, a law, um, uh, a Harry Potter marathon on, you know, stick injuries among children. Just, just use the word marathon and I'll be happy. Uh, if you have uh, people cheering from the sidelines, uh, personal records get better. Oh, interesting. Okay. So looking at whether or not either more people in the, uh, more, um, more participants, not more spectators make the personal record times get better. Okay. Or maybe more people that, you know, so imagine there's people there who are supposed to come and support you, um, but didn't. Now there is a sort of a selection bias problem. Like if there's a particular year when a lot of people come to support you, maybe it's because you trained particularly hard that year and your personal record might expect it to be better. Um, but not, not because the people came to support you, but because you were training hard and the people recognized that they came to see you. Now, what if it were the case that the people who were coming to see you were flying from across the country and uh, for some reason flights were canceled? So you have sort of a natural experiment where some people had spectators come and others didn't uh, for reasons that were orthogonal or unrelated to your actual training. All right, good. What else? What other ideas? If the weather where you're running the marathon or the day that you're running the marathon is similar or different from the weather where you tended to train. Good. Yeah. So this is, um, uh, and, and, you know, there might be some randomness there too, because, you know, maybe the weather is similar most of the time, but once in a while, like in a place like Boston with the weather is very variable, it could be unseasonably warm or unseasonably cold. So you could look at whether or not changes in the weather based on where you trained affect your performance. And I would say that that could very well be random. Great. What else? You know, you might look at these shirts. I'm just looking at this photo here and you might see, okay, there's people wearing dark clothes. There's people wearing white shirts. Is it raise your hand if you're a runner? Most of you are, I think the screens are, are not visible to me, but those, okay. So uh, Dr. Thomas is a runner. So those of you who are runners, have you ever thought to yourself, like on a warm day, I should wear a white shirt versus a dark shirt for better performance? Yeah. So I see some people nodding their heads. Could be true, right? I mean, I don't know that there's a randomized trial that shows that runners who wear white shirts perform better than runners who wear dark shirts. You know, you could certainly imagine that runners who wear white shirts do perform better on average, but that wouldn't be causal because the people who take running seriously, who believe that white shirts will help them perform better, they may just be better runners and have better times on average. So aside from conducting a randomized trial of, of shirt color on performance, any ideas for a sort of a natural experiment? Can you think of a situation where some people by chance would be wearing dark colors and some people by chance would be wearing uh, white colors? Any ideas? I think if you're uh, running for a cause, you might have like a uniform. Yeah, exactly. So if you you're like an expert. So if you didn't if you didn't if you if you didn't say that, I would have said something like uh, Children's Hospital or uh, Leukemia Foundation. Some word to prime you to thinking. All right. Well, sometimes people run for organizations and causes. So here in Boston, let's say you ran for Boston Children's Hospital. One year the shirt might be white. One year the shirt might be dark blue. So you could use that sort of exogenous variation, meaning variation in the shirt color that is unrelated 
to what we would expect of your performance. The same thing is true in a clinical trial. People get randomized or exposed to one intervention versus another for reasons that are unrelated to what we expect of them in terms of their clinical benefit from the treatment or, uh, or control. Okay, all right, so those are not the ideas I was, uh, you know, we studied. Um, now, it's, you look at this road here, it's very crowded. Um, I want you to imagine the side streets. The, the streets are just one or two off from this road right here. What do you think about the traffic? You think there's going to be a lot of traffic or not much traffic? I would think a lot of traffic because of detours. Yeah, de so there could be detours, and there's maybe some areas where there's not much traffic because of detours. All right, so what does that idea that you just said have to do with healthcare? Any ideas? Like, let's relate this idea of detours to something medical. Oh, emergency um, ambulances. If they had to get, get from point A to point B and there's detours, that might delay arrival to the hospital or something. And this is something you probably are all familiar with being in New York. <laughs> in New yes. York. Yeah, exactly. So a few years ago, my wife ran this race in, in Boston. I think it was called the Race to Remember. Um, mm -hmm. And it started in the seaport area of Boston and it went into kind of the downtown area into Cambridge and then went back. And the, um, uh, the race went past Massachusetts General Hospital, which is where I work, and, and she wanted me to come watch her on this race route. And um, so I, I tried to go down our main thoroughfare to park at MGH because I had a parking spot there to see her, but I couldn't get to the hospital because the road is blocked. So I turned around and I went home. Um, and then a few hours later, I saw her at home and, and I told her what happened. She's like, well, what happened to all the people who needed to get to the hospital? And that was sort of an offhand comment. And I thought, wow, you know, we could actually look at that because we can figure out what the dates are of the major marathons uh, in the U.S. We have uh, data from Medicare um, uh, claims data. So we know when people go to the hospital, what they go to the hospital for, what services or procedures are performed, whether they live or die in the next 30 or 60 or 90 days. We know all that information. And so we could put that together to study this question. And, and that's what we did. So here is a plot. This is a, a, a paper that was published in, in 2017 in the New England Journal uh, just a few days, I think, before the Boston Marathon. And what we showed is that for people who are um, hospitalized with a cardiac arrest or heart attack, these are conditions that you don't choose. Uh, in the basically the, the week of the, um, uh, this is not even the way, this is day, the day of the marathon compared to the surrounding days of the week. Uh, and we do that in um, um, uh, marathon affected zip codes and areas in the same region that are not affected. So let's say in Boston, Boston Marathon, there's a number of zip codes that are affected. And then there's places like Quincy, uh, right outside of uh, the marathon area that are going to be unaffected. And so what you see is that on the day of the marathon, there's this large increase in mortality for people who have a cardiac arrest or heart attack compared to the surrounding weeks. And it's a little bit noisy, um, but in the other areas, the surrounding areas, it's quite flat. So the thought is, okay, maybe what's happening uh, to Sakshi's point is that there's uh, you know, road closures that are, that are um, preventing people from getting to the hospital, either by ambulances or some people actually drive themselves if they're having chest pain or are driven by other people. Um, and, and we wanted to unpack that a little bit further. And so what we did is we were able to get some data from a, a select group of these cities that's a smaller group of these cities. Uh, and we had ambulance data. So we knew the time that someone was picked up from their home or their nursing home and taken and dropped off at the, at the hospital. So we knew the trans transit time. And what we looked at is to see is in the morning of the marathon, whether or not there's an increase in ambulance transport times compared to the surrounding areas and compared to the surrounding non-marathon dates. And the same thing in the evenings, because in the evenings, the road should be reopened. So there should be no, quote unquote, marathon day uh, effect. And that's sort of what you see right here. So what you see is that in the, in the top panel on the morning of the marathon, there is an increase in ambulance transport times compared to the non-marathon days. But the uh, surrounding areas are pretty flat. And the opposite, or the, rather, the, that is not true in the evening. So in the evenings, the roads are reopened. There's no marathon day effect on ambulance transport times. Um, I will say that, you know, in, in our sample in Medicare, about a third to 40% of the people who had uh, heart attacks actually were not brought in by an ambulance. So they were probably driven by someone that they know, a family member, I'd guess. We don't know who's doing the driving, but we know it's on an ambulance because there's no ambulance bill to Medicare 
for that person who comes to the ED and is hospitalized. And so, you know, ambulances are going to have a problem clear, clearly from what we can see here. But even more so than ambulances, we know that people who are driving and trying to negotiate these detours, they may not know where they're going. They wouldn't be able to bisect certain routes that an ambulance might be able to bisect. Um, they're going to have even more delays um, in transport times. And so, the, you know, the point of this pa uh, paper is not to say that we shouldn't hold marathons, though I, I will say just... Um, in a sort of a back of envelope calculation, more people die from road closures during marathons any given year in any given city than died in the Boston Marathon bombings. So it does tell you something about what we prioritize in terms of um, interventions to reduce mortality. And, you know, not surprisingly why, but it's an interesting data point. Um, and the point is not to say that we should cancel marathons, but there's two points. One is that if you're hosting these sort of large public events, whether it be a marathon or a Taylor Swift concert, whatever it is, you know, we're always thinking about the safety of the spectators. We're not really thinking about the safety of the people who live in nearby areas whose medical care uh, may be affected if they have acute medical needs, they need to get to the hospital. And the other thing that this study can, can allow you to do, and, and I didn't take it in this direction, was you know, if you're broadly interested in questions about how delays in care affect outcomes, and that's a question that's true for every, um, every specialty. I mean, you know, in, in GI, uh, Emily, you're going into GI. Uh, if someone starts having uh, gastrointestinal bleeding, do they need to wait one hour, two hours, six hours, six days? You're never going to conduct a randomized trial that says, all right, if you have these symptoms, you can wait six hours or two hours, and then we're going to measure what happens to you. No one can conduct that randomized trial, nor, nor would you want to. But here you sort of have this laboratory experiment that happens in the real world where, you know, I picked cardiac arrest and heart attack. But you could pick uh, things like shortness of breath. You could pick things like stroke, um, hip fracture, whatever. You could basically use this as a natural experiment to figure out whether delays on the order of half an hour to an hour could matter for certain clinical outcomes and certain um, um, uh, diseases um, in a way that you wouldn't be able to do in a randomized trial. So there's also sort of a clinical application if one were interested in this type of uh, approach and method. But, you know, as I kind of alluded to earlier, the reason I, I like this idea is because I just thought it was fun. Um, and it uses the tools of economics, it uses big data to sort of answer an interesting um, question. So I spent a little bit more time on um, that example. I'll just keep going. Uh, joint commission, who knows what the joint commission is? Everybody, who, who loves the joint commission? No, oh, I saw I, I, someone put their thumb down. I won't reveal publicly who that was. Um, all right. What ideas come to mind from the words joint commission? Regulations, rules, mm -hmm. laws, policy. And what do you have in mind? Like what would the, what would the, you know, the research question be? Oh, how about the week that they're visiting your site? Uh -huh. There's disruption of care because everything is topsy turvy, or the very act of being observed changes behavior, or something like that. So, what do you think? If you had to guess, which which of those two you think would be more likely? The second one, the act of being second. observed changes behavior. Yeah. Okay. So, I'll say two things. One is, you know, when I see the words joint commission, the first thing that comes to my mind is, does the joint commission, you know, does what the joint commission intend to do have the effects that it that it would like to have meaning does the joint commission work is it effective all right i mean if you look at hospitals that um, um, have uh, joint co commission accreditation versus hospitals that don't they're obviously very different and so you couldn't make a causal interpretation about the effect of the joint commission uh, but that would be a question i think would be first order to figure out like whether or not the regulation of hospitals and it doesn't have to be the joint commission sort of any sort of oversight of hospitals does it improve outcomes? Or is it the case that hospitals, because of a variety of other reasons, already have sufficient incentives um, uh, to deliver higher quality care? Uh, that's an alternative view that's possible as well. I mean, there's medical malpractice, there's professionalism, there's market competition. If you're a bad hospital and everybody knows you're a bad hospital, it's gonna be hard to compete in the market with other hospitals. So there's a lot of reasons why the regulation um, that, uh, um, something like the Joint Commission of Fords may not be needed. I, I don't know the answer to that, that question in, in a causal way, but that's one sort of question. The other question is what, what Sakshi just mentioned, and uh, it starts with a story with my wife again. 
she was, uh, she works at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. She's a radiologist there. And when she was, I think she was a resident or a fellow, um, she gets an email in the morning that says, uh, the Joint Commission is coming to the hospital today. Please do X, Y, and Z. And, uh, you know, she kind of like looks at me with like kind of a, now, I don't know if she rolled her eyes, but it's a strange look. And she says, you know, I bet we're just going to be, people are going to be running around like chickens with their heads cut off. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I could see that. I mean, there's these, all these inspectors descend into a hospital. They're going around doing lots of things. As all of you know, on this call, there's lots of emails that get sent around telling you to do all sorts of things that you wouldn't normally do perhaps in your, in your daily practice. Um, and that could be disruptive. Uh, you know, if you're spending time not drinking coffee, not, uh, you know, you know, doing extra attention to some uh, charting that you may not be doing normally, which means that you weren't in a patient's room or you weren't responding to a page, whatever it may be, you can imagine the number of ways in which outcomes and quality of care could get worse. But you could also imagine that outcomes get better. Like, so for example, um, you know, if you're a medical student and you're, you want to go into orthopedic surgery, and you're doing a rotation on orthopedic surgery, and the, the orthopedic surgeon who you want to write a letter for you is sitting there in the, you know, standing there in the OR, and, and you're doing something, you're going to be extra careful because someone is watching you. And that, that principle is, is well known in the social sciences. People refer to it as the Hawthorne effect. It's the idea that if your behavior is being monitored, um, your behavior will change. And, and that has implications for how we assess things through surveys or monitoring, because you know what the purpose of the surveys and the monitoring is to figure out what people do on a normal basis. But if their behavior changes in response to being monitored, as might happen if the, the Joint Commission comes, then you don't get a true reflection of what the underlying behavior is that you really wanted to, um, to measure. But it could be that that change in behavior has impacts on outcomes um, uh, as well. And it could be either positive or negative. Now, what we found is we were able to get data from about 3,000 Joint Commission visits over several years. The Joint Commission actually you know, has this information online, and you can set up an automated tool to scrape that information from, the, uh, from its website. And we matched that with Medicare data, and we looked at patients who are hospitalized, were admitted to the hospital during the dates of Joint Commission visits. And we basically look at the mortality rates, the 30-day mortality rates for people who are admitted on the, on, the, on the week of versus the surrounding weeks of the Joint Commission visits. And what you see is that people who had happened to be admitted to the hospital the week of a Joint Commission visit, the 30-day mortality is about um, you know, half a percentage point less than um, other weeks in the surrounding weeks. And this, this Joint Commission visit varies across all hospitals, across time and across geography. So it's not like this is always happening on July 4th and there's some you know, July 4th effect or July 4th week effect. That's not what's happening here. These weeks vary across the year, across hospitals. Um, and so this is in, in economics, what we call an event study. The effect seems to be larger in major teaching hospitals, which is what we, what we kind of thought looking into this because we said, well, you know, we know the major teaching hospitals, first of all, they may have more at stake here. And moreover, they often have these large outfits that can be assembled in response to a joint commission visit. I mean, there's a lot of mobilization that happens of quality and safety and other administrative folks within the hospital around these events that may not be able to happen in a smaller, um, a smaller hospital. Now you might say, all right, well, how do we know it's that people's behavior didn't change in response to the things that are being measured? So we looked at that. Um, things like bloodstream infections, catheter associated UTIs, C. diff infection rates, things that might um, uh, reflect increased hand washing, that sort of thing. We didn't find any evidence of that. So those don't change. Now, that's not to say that that's not the mechanism or part of the mechanism, but we just didn't see those, those changes um, um, occurring. Um, so we're kind of left with this idea that maybe this is about behavior changing and people knowing that they're being watched. Uh, we weren't able to pinpoint exactly what changed in this behavior. And I think, you know, I think people who look at this research could rightly say, all right, this is kind of interesting, but so what? Where do you go from there? And to which I would respond, you know, this is the part of the process uh, of this question that's the most interesting to me. One could go multiple steps further by doing qualitative, in-depth interviews of these organizations during the times of these visits, sort of anthropologic uh, assessments where you go and see how behavior is changing. Um, you know, is staffing changing? Is the nature of the interactions of people, the nature of their work, is it changing? And I would say 
you know, that could actually be interesting and could be important. And the reason I say there's a lot of people who are interested in quality and safety. A lot of what we do in quality and safety actually doesn't have any impact on mortality, um, and no measurable impact on mortality. Here's something that clearly is changing in the hospitals when the Joint Commission is there that, that seems to affect mortality. You know, thinking about what that is and seeing if that can be replicated at other points in the year is not a bad idea. Of course, I would never say, and, and you would like someone would boot me off the Zoom if I said that the solution is to have the Joint Commission come every week of the year. It's, it's not like Christmas every day. It's the Joint Commission every day. It's, it doesn't have the same sort of uh, uh, feeling, uh, feeling to it. So that, that wouldn't be the, the follow-on um, um, conclusion. All right, I'll keep going. Um, what is this a photo of? Some expo. It's an expo. Yeah, it's. Uh, can anybody see um, that sign? It's a. It's a circular sign in the middle. American College of Cardiology. American College of oh. Cardiology. ACC. American College of Cardiology. Okay, what ideas come to mind? Was that Andy that unmuted? Yep. Okay. All right. I'm are you Are you a cardiologist or no? Hospitalist. Hospitalist. Okay. Any ideas come to mind? Looking at this photo, I'm thinking the impact of um, pharmaceutical representatives on drug prescribing patterns. Yeah. See, that's the first thing I would have thought. If I looked at this photo, you look at the top, you see Rapatha, 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 Rapatha. There's no shortage of information about Rapatha. And I think even on that column right there that says 91%, I don't know if my vision's right, but I think that also says Rapatha. So you know, if you look at this, this is sort of a nice natural experiment because there's a lot of literature about uh, the role of pharmaceutical advertising on physician decisions. Then, you know, the literature is, is challenged by the fact that it's mostly really associational. It, there's no natural experiment framework to most of those studies. So um, what you really want is a situation where you randomize some doctors to advertisements and you randomize other doctors to not having those advertisements. And then you look and see um, 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 how they, how they practice. Now here you could look and see whether or not um, prescribing of Rapatha goes up before or after such an event. The challenge here might be that, is it the advertising that caused that? Or maybe there's new clinical trials that get released during ACC that suggest the benefit of, of this drug, which is, I think it's a PCSK9 um, um, inhibitor. So it'd be hard to distinguish between those two, but I'll tell you, we did look and see whether brand versus generic prescribing changes after these events under the idea that like, if you go to one of these events, you might be exposed to drug reps uh, who talk to you about the product and there's an equivalent generic product that's available um, for that same branded drug. Do we see increases in branded prescribing? We, we actually don't. So, uh, but to your point, Andy, that was the first idea that I thought of. Uh, Prachi writes in the chat, impact of cardiologists being at the expo on mortality rates for patients admitted during the same week at their hospital. Okay, Prachi, what do you think? You think mortality would go up or go down? So cardiologists are, let's say, in this room. They're not at their um, not at their hospital. Who thinks who thinks more uh, mortality would go up because staffing up because understaffed? Okay, so Sakshi says up. So that's what I would think too. Um, when I was a resident, um, and I think I was I can't remember when it was. It was either the AHA American Heart Association or ACC American College of Cardiology meetings. Uh, I was um, um, in the CCU. And I remember thinking that they're just like the staffing felt a little bit lower. Um, and it wasn't incredibly lower. It's not like people who needed PCI weren't getting PCI or if they needed ECMO, they weren't getting ECMO. It's not like that, uh, but it felt like it was uh, lower staff. And I thought, <clears throat> I thought to myself, to your point, Sachi, that you know, outcomes might get worse because the staffing is lower. Maybe the expertise of the physicians who remain behind, maybe these are younger doctors, uh, less experienced. Uh, the outcomes could be worse. So we looked at this. We basically collected the dates of these meetings over probably 10 years. We matched it to Medicare data. We look at patients who have um, heart failure, AMI, so heart attack, or cardiac arrest. Um, and we stratify them to like high-risk heart failure. So this is not like garden variety heart failure. These are people who have a 30-day mortality rate of something like 20%. So that's a serious sort of um, heart failure. Uh, high-risk AMI. So these, again, these are not the patients who come and get PCI and get discharged in a couple of days. These are people who have mortality rates of like 40%. And then of course, cardiac arrest is by definition, um, extraordinarily severe um, um, in terms of its mortality. And what we found is, let me just focus on cardiac arrest. If you happen to have a cardiac arrest during any day of the year, 
or let's say the surrounding days of these meetings, not during the meeting itself, but the surrounding days, your 30-day mortality rate, if you made it to the hospital alive uh, after cardiac arrest, your 30-day mortality rate from the hospitalization is 70%. So 70 out of 100 people who had a cardiac arrest who are in the hospital then die within 30 days. If you have that um, happen, that cardiac arrest occur on the date of a cardiology meeting, it's about 60%. That's a 10 percentage point reduction in mortality if you happen to have a cardiac arrest during the dates of the AHA or ACC meetings compared to the surrounding weeks uh, of the year. Um, I'll just tell you that that effect size, that percentage point reduction is larger in magnitude than the reductions that you get from statins, PCIs, beta blockers, you know, you put them all together, uh, make them into a cocktail, whatever you do, it's not going to be as large as that. So this is sort of an interesting I mean, it's, it's interesting because it, it suggests that there's something about the staffing, the, the types of people who are in the hospital that's different. The way I interpret it is that there's something about the practice pattern that is different. And I want to emphasize that because in medicine, I mean, think about what we teach residents. We teach residents on rounds about this trial and this drug versus that drug, the latest study in JAMA or whatever. You know, that's what we teach. But there's something about all that information get, that gets wrapped up into a physician's mind and into their practice. And those practice patterns seem to have a very big effect on the outcomes of patients. And that is an area where I think we spend considerably less attention trying to understand how the evidence that gets synthesized in this elegant way that is randomized controlled trials ultimately gets translated into how we educate doctors and into the practice, practice patterns that emerge from their uh, training. Uh, we did a follow-up study of this where we looked at um, a specific cardiology meeting called TCT. You think it's transcatheter therapeutics. It's for interventional cardiologists. And we went further into, into looking at the actual Medicare claims data to identify who are the doctors who were billing during the dates of that meeting and the doctors who were not. So doctors who were not, we thought they may have been attending the meetings because they weren't billing seeing patients during the dates of the meetings they're at higher likelihood of being at the meetings itself. And then we link that information, the who are the stayers and who are the attendees of the meetings, the things like clinical trial publications, um, NIH grants, all that stuff. And what you see is that the people who are attending the meetings are you know, much more likely to be clinically uh, clinical trial investigators, have federal funding, lots more publications. So there is a difference in the types of doctors who go to these meetings than the types of doctors who stay behind, which is something that you would have expected, but with the sort of data that we have, we're able to actually um, show. All right, who has children? Many of you probably have children. Um, a school entry age cutoff, I'll just tell you what that is and then ask you for ideas. A school entry age cutoff means if, you're, um, if you turn five, let's say by September 1st in, in the state of Massachusetts, then you can enter kindergarten. If you turn five after September 1st, you have to wait a year for public school uh, before you enter kindergarten. So the kids who are born in, in August, they enter kindergarten at age five and they're the youngest kids in their class. Um, the kids who are, you know, have September 5th birthdays, they have to wait a year. So when they enter kindergarten, um, they're going to be almost six. So what does it have to do with ADHD? Is the uh, diagnosis of ADHD more common in those uh, school districts where uh, the school age entry is, is later. So younger kids are going at an earlier point in time. Good. Okay. So David is saying that there's something about the, the school entry cutoff where the younger kids, uh, you said that you said the younger kids are going at a, a earlier point in time and the older kids are going at a later point in time. Is that what I heard? Yeah. I mean, if kids end up going to school at an earlier age, because the cutoff yes. is, is such, are there, are those districts more likely to have an increased diagnosis of ADHD, which would be my anticipation because there's going to be less focus, less maturity, et cetera. So there's going to be a bias towards increased diagnosis of ADHD. That's exactly right. So we don't do it at the district level, like you suggested. We actually look at it at the, um, at the patient level, at the child level, because we have insurance data. We know the birth date, you know, just like uh, your insurer, which I presume is the hospital, knows your medical conditions. They know your birth date. Um, they know your address, things like that. We know the birth dates of the, pe the people in our data. So we can see that kids who are born in August compared to kids who are born in September are more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. So this is a plot. This was in, in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago. And we basically looked at the likelihood of ADHD diagnosis 
between kids who had August birthdays and September birthdays. I've plotted out each month month comparison here, but for ease, let's just say a kid who's born on August 25th should be in theory identical to a kid who's born on September 5th. There's like no systematic reason why those two kids should be different uh, in you know, their expected comorbidities, risks of ADHD uh, diagnosis. And yet what we see is that the kids who have um, August birthdays are about 30% more likely um, to be diagnosed and treated with ADHD than kids with September birthdays. The, the left axis is, I think, out of, um, these are these are so like one per thousand or two per thousand. That's the rate of diagnosis of ADHD. Um, but the relative risk is about a 30% increase in the likelihood of treatment, uh, diagnosis and treatment if a child is born in August. And the reason why we think is to your point, is if a, if a, if a kid is, is uh, you know, misbehaving in class or is perceived to be inattentive, uh, one thing that the teacher is going to think about is uh, whether or not that child has ADHD. Conversation occurs with a counselor, maybe a parent, ultimately a, a pediatrician or a doctor, another doctor. And the next thing you know, that child um, is diagnosed with ADHD at a 30% higher rate than a child born in September not because the child is, has some pathology that is different that would be underlying the ADHD risk, but because the child is just young for their age. Uh, we have some other work which, which we haven't published yet, which looks at a similar idea for teen pregnancy. So if you look at uh, teen girls, um, girls who are um, young for their grade, let's say they have August birthdays, they're more likely to become teen moms than, than girls who are old for their age again, induced by this cutoff, let's say with a September birthday, we think the reason why is that peer pressure might be different. You know, if you have a girl who's 14 in a class with kids are almost 15, that's different than if she's 15, almost 15, and her peers are much younger. So these sort of uh, relative age effects, and in economics, people talk a lot about these issues because they, they seem to have downstream effects on income and education and other, other uh, factors as well. But these relative age effects are, are, are you know, quite dramatic. Uh, I will say, and we don't have a slide to show this, um, uh, we're just doing some work last week looking at ADHD diagnoses on Halloween. So it's kind of the intuition, the idea was basically like you've got kids who on any given day are going to the doctor and there's always a probability that a child is diagnosed with ADHD. Um, maybe, they're, maybe they're going to the doctor for evaluation or, or maybe this kind of evolves out of a discussion and a routine visit. But the rate of uh, ADHD diagnosis is higher on Halloween, which we think might be due to the anticipation of a child of Halloween events. And so their behavior might just be different in the actual um, you know, room with the doctor. And the whole point about this is that you know, ADHD is a diagnosis <coughs> which has a subjective component to it. Right? It's not like a blood test or um, you know, a highly specific physical exam that allows you to diagnose the condition. There's behavioral components to it, which are going to be important and subjective components on the part of the person who's making the diagnosis. So subtle things like how a child is behaving for random reasons, like Halloween being that day or that night, um, could have effects. All right, we have about, uh, I'll you know, wrap it up in about six minutes and take some questions. Uh, we've done a lot of work with um, uh, a company called Doximity. Um, I don't know if, if you know what Doximity is. I, I kind of describe it as like the LinkedIn uh, for medicine, a lot of doctors have profiles with Doximity, and they've collected a lot of data over the years um, on where, phys <coughs> excuse me, where physicians have trained, uh, their experience, publications, grants, all sorts of things. And we have linked that data with promotion data, with, um, uh, with salary data from public medical schools. So if you have colleagues that work at UCSF, you can actually see what they are paid because they're state employees, uh, and state employee salaries have to be reported publicly in certain states. So if you want to feel good or feel bad, I don't know, depending on what, you know, what your colleagues do, you can look them up on the UCSF or the you know, California uh, Transparent Pay um, website. So we scrape data from all of those public medical schools for which salary information is publicly available. And we linked it to data that we had from Doximity. And we've done a bunch of work looking at uh, showing differences in promotion rates, pay rates. We, we had a paper just come out yesterday in Health Affairs that shows that the lifetime income difference between men and women is about $2 million over a physician's career. Even if you account for things like uh, experience, specialty, the prestige of the institution where they trained, how many clinical trials they run, how much federal funding they have, how many scientific publications they have, 
how many patients they see, what's their Medicare revenue, like measures of clinical and research productivity, we're able to actually account for a lot of those things, which is, is possible in medicine. You know, it's, it's harder to do in other occupations and other industries because you don't have that sort of rich data on what are the inputs that might go into salaries and income and negotiations. But anyway, what, one question that's come up in that research is whether or not there's different, a lot of questions that come up, but one question that comes up is, is it, is it true or is, is there any evidence that women and men sort of promote or sell themselves um, differently? And so I want to ask you, like, how would you look at that? How would you see whether or not men and women in, in academic medicine sort of sell themselves differently to their colleagues, their peers, their bosses? Any ideas? All right, let me give you like a more focused question. Imagine you had data. Oh, someone put something in the chat. Um, Twitter. Okay, Amy said Twitter. Yeah, and there's an, a, a few papers out now recently that show differences in, in uh, tweeting and retweets and things like that between men and women. So that might be one way. You could look at a man, a, you know, group of men, group of women who have a publication that comes out on a given day. Do they tweet about it at different rates? So that would be one way to sort of assess that question. Imagine that you had data from PubMed. All of you use PubMed. Uh, on, let's say, 5 million abstracts, you know, the language in the abstracts, and you know the names of the authors, so you can identify men and women authors. What ideas come to mind? You have the language in the abstracts, and you have the names of the authors, and you can identify the gender composition of the teams. What ideas? Focus your minds like on the abstract. You have everything that's written in the abstract. What would allow you to look at whether or not men and women promote themselves differently if you had the language in the abstract? Okay, so someone in the chat wrote, um, Prachi wrote, look at words they use to describe themselves compared to the words they use to describe unprecedented. Okay, all right. So here's an example from um, PubMed. These are two journal, same journal, Nature Materials, a journal that we may all read uh, at night when the uh, ambient is not working. Um, subject category, biological materials, small functional groups for control differentiation of hydrogel encapsulated human mesenchymal stem cells. It's an area that's near and dear to my heart. Um, this is work by Danielle and Christy, first and last author. And then you have the article on the right, which is by Matthew and Oleg. These are both men. Um, the article on the right describes work that is promising, unique, novel, and somehow remarkably uh, assuring. So uh, Prachi, this is exactly what you could do. You could look at 5 million articles. You could automate a process in which you search for these terms. You could account for or control for the publication in which the article appears. Because you know maybe it is the case that men are more likely to publish high impact work because they have more funding, whatever it may be, but you can account for that. So we're looking at two articles published in the same year in, in JAMA, same topic area, same number of downstream citations, so we think equivalently important, and we look to see whether or not there's differences in the types of words that are used. And what you see is that female female teams, meaning first author last author, are about 10% less likely to use terms uh, like novel, groundbreaking, and unique compared to uh, male male teams. So there is a difference in the language that is used to describe um, uh, the research. And this sort of methodology has been applied in economics. There's a paper that looks at um, uh, submissions to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. These are blinded submissions. Uh, and um, the grants that were funded um, were more often among men, even though it's blinded. Um, but the language that is used is, is systematically different to describe the, the nature of the research, the contribution of the research. So this is sort of a big data way to, to look at that um, sort of question. Um, let me let me just wrap up with telling you the answer to this because it's kind of interesting, and then I'll take some maybe high level questions. Um, when you go to the grocery store and you see something that's four dollars and ninety nine cents, you might ask yourself, "Well, why is it four dollars and ninety nine cents instead of five dollars?" It'd be easier for it to be five dollars. The reason why is because the mind looks at that number and they look at the leftmost digit, and that leftmost digit is a four, and four is obviously less than five. That item feels like it's four dollar ish. Whereas the item that's $5, is, it feels like it's $5. So that's this idea of left digit bias, the idea that the mind is drawn to the leftmost digit in a series of numbers. Uh, and the reason why retailers sell things for $4.99 is because it feels like it's cheaper, even though it's not. 
Now that same intuition could be applied to medical issues as well. So if you look at patients who come to the hospital who are 79 years old in 50 weeks, they're right about to turn 80. Uh, the doctor might look at them and say, oh, this looks like a 70-ish year old male versus an 80-ish year old male. The older people are the less likely are doctors to want to do aggressive things like um, cabbage, for example, coronary artery bypass graft surgery. And what we see is that people who have a heart attack who admitted to the hospital by chance a week or two before their 80th birthday are more likely to be to offered and receive cabbage than patients who come to the hospital just a week or two after their 80th birthday. So it's this idea of left edge of bias in action. The mind looks at the seven and 79 and thinks this is a person in their 70s as opposed to in their 80s. And then because of that, the clinical decision is different. Uh, this sort of finding has now been replicated in other areas um, uh, as well, and transplant surgery and in places where you wouldn't think these sorts of heuristics come into play, because in economics, we think it's these mental shortcuts occurring when you have to make decisions rapidly. But that's not always the case. I mean, the cabbage decision is a decision that's taken seriously. You don't just make it in, in 10 seconds. Um, it's thought out and it's reasoned. And even in those settings, we see that these sort of mental shortcuts or cognitive biases um, that um, have been written about, like in the book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, these sorts of things still occur. So let, let me pause there and, and take room, uh, take time for questions. Um, I hope this was entertaining to you. It's obviously different than I think what you normally hear. And I think the format was probably different. Um, what I want to impress upon you all is that I don't think you have to have background in, uh, in economics or statistics to do this kind of work. It's really all about the ideas. And, you know, I just showed you a couple of photos or words and, you know, on the spot, you were able to come up with what I think are really interesting sorts of questions and, and observations. And, and, and I mean, I'm happy to talk with you more offline about people who are interested in this kind of work. So I will stop there and, and thank you for the time. Thank you, good. Dr. Jenna. Any, any more questions? Any questions for Dr. Jenna? It was a nice and interactive session for sure. Sakshi, there's a fabulous session. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. To yes, Annie, I'm going to yeah. un un get my video back on for a second. Um, I thought that was great. Really, really uh, fun to listen to and, and a lot of interesting, uh, provocative uh, messages for, for, for me in the group. Um, the, the difference between the two groups in most of your analyses is relatively small, like 1%, less than 1%, a couple of percent. It, it seems to have really big ticket implications at the level of society and the way we treat groups and maybe less on the, the kid who you're worried about ADHD or um, an individual. I, I was wondering if you have thoughts about, you know, is this more of a impact on society or on individuals that were? I think, I think that's right. I mean, and I, you know, I would extend that probably to even just Clinton, you know, a lot of the clinical treatments that we use, like, you know, when you, when you prescribe a patient a statin, you don't think, I mean, I don't think to myself, all right, this is going to keep this person, this statin is going to keep this person alive, right? Um, that might be true for PCI, uh, but for a statin, I mean, we're always thinking about the population health benefits because the, the overall effect sizes can be small. I think in a lot of the stuff that I do, the effect sizes are small to modest. In, in other cases, they might be large, like in the cardiology meeting study, that was a 10 percentage point effect uh, for cardiac arrest, which is pretty, pretty large. Um, there's a study that we did using flu uh, and birthdays because the idea is that kids who have August birthdays, when they go to their pediatrician for their August you know, three-year checkup, the vaccine isn't available in the office yet versus a kid who has a September or October birthday. When they go for their three-year checkup, the vaccine is available in the office. And there we find much larger, like you know, 10, 20 percentage point differences in vaccination rates. So I think it depends on the context, but it's certainly the case, Andy, that there may be areas where the effect sizes are small and the real kind of Take home isn't at the individual person level, but at a, a wider group level. Yeah, thanks. No, thank you. Anyone else? Any, uh, one last question, maybe? I, I will say that if you like this sort of stuff, uh, if the if the kind of way that I talked about it and the material is of interest to you, you should check out Freakonomics MD. This is the sort of thing that I talk about. Some of these things I actually mentioned on the podcast, but a lot of it is going to be other people's work as well. Um, that's of this similar sort of uh, flavor. Great. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Jenna. There's another someone commenting on that, that they enjoy your podcast. And uh, thank you very much. Really enjoyed your talk. Congratulations on receiving the Drapkin Award. And thank you so much to the Drapkin family for continuing to support our department. So have a really great day. Enjoy the day, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Jenna. Take care. Thank you. Take everybody. it easy. Thanks very much.